everyone welcome to my channel before watching this video don't forget to like comment and subscribe now let's start this video admiralty jurisdiction and maritime law all of the terms admiralty law and maritime law are often used synonymously in the united states they are in fact distinct from one another the framers of the united states constitution Use both word in Article 3, Section 2, the judicial power shall extend to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. United States Coast R3. Admiralty law is comprised of rules that define the scope of the court's admiralty jurisdiction, while maritime law is the substantive law applied by a court exercising admiralty jurisdiction. Maritime law consists of substantive rules created by federal courts referred to as general maritime law which do not arise from the constitution or legislation of the United States. However, the federal court's power to create these rules does arise from the constitution sorry, from the constitution grant of admiralty jurisdiction as does congress as does Congress limited power to supplement admiralty law. General maritime law may apply rules that are customarily applied in other countries or those which are purely domestic. The federal courts have also occasionally looked to state law in resolving maritime disputes. American admiralty and maritime law originally developed from British Admiralty Courts present in American colonies which operated separate from courts of law and equity. Through the Judiciary Act of 1789, the United States Congress placed Admiralty and Maritime Law under the jurisdiction of the Federal District Courts. Parties may not contract out of admiralty jurisdiction and states may not influence of admiralty jurisdiction, either judicially or legislatively. However, admiralty courts are those of limited jurisdiction and do not extend to non-maritime matters. The saving to suitors clause provides for concurrent state jurisdiction to allow for non-admiralty remedies as well. Maritime law as it related to salvage. The collection of maritime laws created around 900 before common era in Athens, specifically the city-state of Rhodes, first codified the principle of offering a reward for the saving of imperialized maritime property. One-fifth of any property saved from an imperialized vessel was awarded to the sulfur. If the sulfur, if the vessel was already lost to the sea, either one third or one half was awarded to the sulfur, depending on the danger taken to retrieve the item. Further, Rodian law punished those who took anything from a wreck by violence by requiring the looter to return the property for fault. As Rhodes became part of the Roman Empire, Roman law adopted Rhodian maritime law. The Roman Byzantine Code and Digest of the Roman Byzantine Code and Digest of Justinian, compiled around 500, 500 Anno Domini, contain edicts and opinions which reflect Mediterranean maritime law practices, including the doctrine of the self-first strike to be reward for his voluntary service even if the service were rendered without the owner's request or knowledge. This doctrine was known as negotium gestio and was based on the theory of preventing unjust enrichment of one of the expenses of another. With the decline of the Roman Empire, Selfish law principles were passed on as found in the Marine Ordinance of the Italian city of Trani in 1063 Anno Domini. Less than 200 years later, the laws of the Oleron or Rolls de Oleron 
from a port city of France which contained provisions related to the law of salvage and fines, were introduced into the English legal system by King Richard I during his reign from 1189 to 1199. These laws were strikingly similar to the maritime rules in Spain and to those developed in Sweden in 1505, known as the Rules of Visby. Surviving the transfer of laws from civilization to civilization over the centuries were three main concepts of salvage law. First, the property right in the wreck vessel may escape or revert to the state. Second, a wreck vessel may be claimed by whoever first locates and obtains possession of it. And third, that the leader of the wreck vessel remains with the owner, but the owner may be required to pay a salvage award to whoever saves the property and return and return it to the owner. Generally, the efforts and expense undertaken by one man to preserve the property of another do not create a lien upon the property benefit or an obligation to repay the expenditure. However, the exception of this rule is the maritime law concept of selfage. The reasoning underlying this policy arising out of the importance of trade, the peril of sea, and that the property saved was in exceptional circumstances. The public policy difference. Generally, the efforts and expenses undertaken by one man to preserve the property of another do not create a lien upon the property benefit or an obligation to repay the expenditure. However, the exception to this rule is maritime law concept of selfage. The reasoning underlying this policy arising out of the importance of trade, the pearl of sea, and that the property safe was in exceptional circumstances. The public policy difference between rewarding for selfage at sea versus, versus on land still persists in today's modern world. A lawsuit for a salvage award may be brought against either the vessel owner or the vessel itself in rem. In an in rem proceeding, the rest, an example, an object from the wreck, must be present in the district when the suit is filled or during the pendency of the action. To claim a salvage award, there must be a nexus between the item salvage and traditional maritime activities although this has been liberally interpreted. A person may provide salvage service to a vessel and its cargo without first receiving a request from the owner or agent of the vessel if it appears that a reasonable owner would have agreed to the service if he was present to do so. However, services which are rendered despite the objection of the person in authority over the vessel will not receive a salvage award. A surfer must have a specific intent to a specific intent to confer a benefit on the salvage vessel rather than another intention altogether. Salvage law is divided into two different claims pure salvage and contract salvage. Pure salvage most closely resemble the historical origins of salvage law. A pure salvage claim has three elements. First, the property self was exposed to a marine peril. Second, the service was voluntary with no pre-existing duty or contract to rescue. And third, the operation must be successful either in whole or in part. Marine peril does not need to be imminent or absolute. All, all that is required is that the party seeking the award demonstrate that the reasonable apprehension of peril excited. The self-vessel only need to be exposed to a danger that could lead to further damage without the service provided.
the owner of the vessel has the burden of proving that the service were not voluntary. For example, the self vessel's crew has a pre-existing using duty to vessel under more circumstances. Okay, everyone, that's all this article today. Thank you so much for watching this video. Until the next one, bye-bye.